If I give this book less than three stars, I'm not posting this video. I can tell you that now. Tuatha, Tuatha and Tuatha and. On. I feel like I'm at the point in the book now actually where I can see potential for the future. That's boring, it's tired and I don't care. So I am 124 pages into Eye of the World by Robert Jordan and it's time to talk spoilers. Not necessarily right now, because I don't think I have anything to say at this minute that is overtly spoilery, but I just, I keep putting this book or not picking this book up actually when I pick this up I'm so absorbed but I keep avoiding it picking it up and one of the reasons is because I want to start this video I want to make this spoilery video hopefully for the whole series so I guess this is just your warning to let you guys know this is a book diary there's spoilers in this video if you haven't read this book and if you don't want to be spoiled then come back to me when you've read it and we will chat but this is obviously the wheel of time is obviously one of those fantasy series a core fantasy series that's up there with Game of Thrones, The Realm of the Eldlings, um, Malazan, the Gentleman Bastard series, like the core fantasy series that everybody feels like they should read. And because of that, because it's on such a pedestal, I am terrified of reading this in case I hate it. And at 124 pages, all I can say is so far so good. I can't even at this point really tell you what this is about. As I'm sure you guys know, if you're watching this, you're probably at least a little bit of a seasoned fantasy reader and you will know that the beginning of a fantasy series doesn't even necessarily have anything to do with like the core themes and plot of the series because a lot of it is just set up and getting everything kind of like where it needs to be. I have watched the show for this as well. I didn't love it. It was all right and I will probably continue to watch it but already just so early and I'm already seeing differences between the show and the book. When it comes to series like this I do like to watch the show first because I feel like that helps with a little bit of context. I'm a visual reader so it helps to put like faces to names and give me like the groundwork to help me like be more absorbed in the text. Now bear in mind because like I've made videos like this before and I'll say something 100 pages into a, a 15 book series and somebody will jump in here and tell me I'm wrong because in book seven something happens. Bear in mind where I am right now but if I had to give you guys a synopsis of this right now based on my knowledge and what I think is going to happen based on what I've discovered so far, the wheel of time keeps turning. We know this. This is all we know from the synopsis because it's very vague and it doesn't give you very many specifics, but the wheel of time keeps turning. Every age is a turn of the wheel and every age the same things happen that have happened in the ages before. Now I know that we have a dark force in here. I believe that they're called the dark one and what I believe is happening is that every age is getting gradually worse and there is this eternal struggle between the force of dark and the force of light. Now we do have this character in here that is central and pivotal to the series called the Dragon Reborn. At this point I don't know whether the dragon is a pawn for the agents of dark and light or whether the dragon is the force for light but the dark one and the dragon continue to face off and the reason why I don't know whether the dragon is the the agent of light is because I think that the dragon in every age makes things better or makes things worse which makes me feel like they're a pawn that can be like used by either side kind of like a catalyst to um make like they're the thing that actually makes things better or worse but they're influenced by darkness or light. Now we have the Aes Sedai in here who are sorceresses who I believe are agents of light and they also seem to be knowledge keepers. They use I think it's the one power that's how they harness their magic and the main one we have in here Moraine has mentioned already in this book that they've already lost so much knowledge and lost so much power and I think that that could be a result of the dark one like making every age a little bit darker so the agents of light are losing essentially. So that is just me making an educated guess on what I think the scope of this series is and I'm guessing that eventually the Dragon Reborn is going to tip the world towards good again. I am hoping for a bit of grey morality in the middle where like we're teetering between like either side. So in this book we are meeting our central characters and everyone's I don't know what the like the time period that this series spans but I think that the main characters like Rand and 
Perrin and Matt and Egwene are all, I would estimate, about 15, 16. And then we have a few older characters, which is Lan, Moraine and Nynaeve. So the thing that I'm really enjoying about this at this point is that it is a typical high fantasy kind of setting. I'm seeing how it's Tolkien-esque, but it's quite comforting in the setting and the tone because it's very familiar to me and like high fantasy that I've read before, which is good because it's helping me like get absorbed into it quickly. And considering it's slow and I am aware that this series is very slow, I'm sinking into it quite easily and getting quite absorbed in it when I'm picking it up. And in terms of it being Tolkien-esque, I'm not a fan of Lord of the Rings. I really don't like it. And I don't like that heavily descriptive writing style. I know that the writing in here is a little bit Tolkien-esque, but what I'm noticing is that while it's descriptive, the description is like a paragraph and then it kind of goes back to the relevant information. And while we have these paragraphs quite frequently, what's not happening is we're going off on like three page tangents describing trees, which is what I hate. Or in the case of like the Earthsea series by Ursula K. Le Guin, where we have like two pages of description of a place and then something like we go back to the plot and then the beginning of the next chapter, it's like two pages of description and then like plot. So yeah, so far so good. I'm really enjoying it. This video is going to be like any reactions and thoughts I have while I'm reading and also my favourite bit, any theories I have of things to come based on what I find out from this book. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy and I hope I do too because I, I, if I give this book less than three stars, I'm not posting this video. I can tell you that now. <laughs> So I'm just setting up for sprints that are starting in around 20 minutes, but I got up to page 194 of this last night. And first off, it's just the way that Rand is obsessed with Egwene is really something. Like the way that we read like half a chapter of him just watching her and being like, well, she shouldn't do this and she doesn't want to do this and she's deluding herself if she thinks that this is going to happen. It's like, dude, let it go. Because like, she's not even really doing anything. He's just staring at her and obsessing about all of these things that she apparently shouldn't do. I have heard people in passing, I haven't paid attention too much to be honest, but I have heard people talk about the representation, female representation in this series. I feel like it is going to be a classic series where we're definitely going to have like a male, like dominant figure with supporting female characters. Although I will say that while the way that Rand is obsessed with Egwene is giving me the ick, I feel like Egwene in herself is not what I would call like a weak female character. So far I'm happy with like that representation. Obviously it is still very early days. I'm like a quarter of the way through the first book. But we also have like a matriarchal society within here with the Aes Sedai as well. Which interesting because I found out in this, like the last two sections that I've read, I found out that the reason why there's no male Aes Sedai is because they went mad. Something to do with the Dark One. Which is interesting. And then somebody also said that when the world was broken it was the male Aes Sedai that were responsible. Also interesting how we have like male and female power in here with the men controlling fire and earth which is magic that is now lost because of everything that happened with the breaking of the world and then water air and i think spirit are female magics but something that's interesting is the false dragon and i do have a little bit of knowledge from the show and i have to say i am invested in the false dragon in the show because the actor is the same guy who plays the professor in money heist which is one of my favorite shows i think i don't know i'm, I'm giving you a theory i don't know whether it's something that's really obvious but i feel like he's not actually a dragon because there's only one dragon and I feel like that's going to be run. I feel like he is a male Aes Sedai because I believe he's a little bit mad as well and that kind of checks with how the male Aes Sedai go mad if they're not found before their power like manifests. So that's just a couple of thoughts from the last like 50 pages that I've read. Um, but yeah, still so far so good. I'm still enjoying it. So I am now just past the halfway point. I'm on page 410, which is chapter, I'm about to start chapter 28. And I feel like this is why I don't normally make vlogs for series like this. Like I don't normally do spoilers because the payoff in the vlogs and the payoff in my reactions I feel only happen later in the series because when I read the first book in the series I just don't, I'm absorbing everything and I also feel that with high epic fantasy if we think of like Game of Thrones and we think of the Stormlight Archive the first book is not a good representation of what the series is actually going to be because I'm halfway through this and I don't really have anything to report. I will say that I don't really like following Rand. I'm assuming that he's going to have some character growth 
throughout this. I mean, he has to, right? His obsession with Egwene is weird, but I've noticed that everybody does it because I'm now I'm into the part where like we split up and it's a bit more multi-perspective and like Perrin is doing it as well, but not to the point that Rand does where he's like weirdly obsessed with her. And I also find him to be like, he thinks he knows what's what, like he thinks he's hot shit, but he actually doesn't know anything. And it's like very naive of him. So I find that really frustrating when he's like acting like the big man, when really he's just like this village boy and he's not even that old either. Moraine, I like her because she has a lot of knowledge about the world. And one of my favorite things about fantasy is, I guess, gaining that knowledge. You always have that kind of character that knows a little bit more that imparts the wisdom and like tells you important things about like the history of the world, which is what Moraine is fulfilling. But I also find her to be a little bit patronizing sometimes. And sometimes when she goes off on one of her like historical info dumps, it is like, it's a bit much. <laughs> To follow when she's giving you just like spurting out a historical account of a battle. Where I'm up to, Perrin and Egwene have just left the Tuatha, Tuatha An, Tuatha An, Tuatha An, Tuatha An, tu Tuatha, tu Tuatha, the Tinkers. <laughs> which I really enjoyed learning about, or I am really enjoying learning about the different cultures of this world because they all have their own prophecies, like the Tuatha, the, the Tuatha and Tuatha and Tuatha. Tuatha and why is that so hard? I feel like I can do it in my head, but I can't say it out loud. But they're looking for the song and they lost the song at the breaking of the world and they believe when they find the song that that heralds the age of legends again. I'm finding stuff like that really interesting because maybe we'll have instances like later down in the series, I mean, I imagine we will, where like they do find their song and then we also have like other cultures that we haven't met people from yet like the ale and we had the recounting in the last chapter i've read where like the um somebody had passed on a message to the tinkers from a camp like an ale camp that was slaughtered so i'm trying to like it's just a lot there's a lot of information in this book and i always find with high fantasy that the first book kind of doesn't stick in my head because it's all of this contextual information that you don't have the context for until later on which is why epic fantasy is so great to reread and i wish i had the time to read every epic fantasy twice because i feel like there's so much value that you can like glean from a reread but um yeah so far i am really enjoying it still i'm really liking the writing style i am enjoying that we're um we've split off a little bit just because that takes us out of ron's perspective constantly which is kind of it's refreshed it a little bit because i was starting to get not annoyed with following him but i feel like there's more interesting things happening with the side characters like i'm more interested in some of their stories than I am necessarily runs. Like now that we split off, Perrin has the thing with the wolves, which actually something that I really enjoy about reading fantasy is seeing how it's influenced other fantasy. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a direct influence as well from book to book. It can be like the folklore that has been drawn on to create the fantasy is the same folklore as used by other authors. But I love seeing similarities, like just the, I can't talk about other things in detail, obviously, because it's just spoilers for this book. How we have the Wheel of Time and the dragon and how that has similarities to like the catalyst in the realm of the eldlings and then we have the wolves and how this magic is old magic that predates the Aes Sedai and it's frowned upon a little bit similarly to how we have the wit and the skill in the realm of the eldlings we also have this prophecy of the dark one and how he's going to blind the eye of the world and part of the gleeman song says something about the long night falling which is very similar to like the big scary bad thing in game of thrones that everybody's saying doesn't exist like they're saying it doesn't exist in here it's all legends it's all grumpkins and snarks when it's not it's a very real threat so i'm also enjoying finding similarities throughout like other fantasy that i've read also the barrier and the veil because a lot of people say that the what's it called a shadow of what was lost by james islington is a pretty much a direct copy like the first book is a direct copy of wheel of time i kind of get it now because i'm once again seeing similarities between this and that with the dark one and the barrier and how there's like a he's trapped in is it should should shadow logoth shale ghoul i keep getting confused between shadow logoth which is the city that they visit in here and shale ghoul which is 
is the prison of the dark one but that is um reminiscent of kind of one of the main threats of the Lycanius trilogy by James Islington so yeah I'm still having um a really good time with it just in terms of reactions and theories and things right now I, I just don't really have anything because the thought like I'm not enmeshed in the world yet like I'm a beginner I'm learning and I don't have enough information right now to to have any thoughts I guess. So I feel like I've finally reached a point in this book where I am starting to have theories. I've I kind of feel like I'm getting to grips with what's going on and it's like we're starting to connect a couple of things potentially these are just ideas realistically while i have seen season one of the show i don't actually remember many of the plot points i'm only really referencing it in my mind contextually in that like yes i know what this character looks like yes i know what this place looks like which as a visual reader watching the show really helps me with stuff like that because um i have like things to build like things already in my brain images already in my brain so i don't have to like mentally do the work of like fucking raising a city from nothing but matt i know that he has this cursed dagger and i know that's what's making him paranoid but i'm wondering like the extent of this and i don't i remember this happening in the show as well but i don't remember any resolution to it and i know once again the show is helping me out because Logain, who is the false dragon i'm at the point still where everyone's making their way to camelin to rendezvous there and it just so happens that the false dragon is also going to be rolling in at around this time so i still haven't met him yet and i do remember him being in the show and the actor that plays him is the guy who plays the professor in money heist which is how I know he's going to be a relevant character because he's a great actor I will love him so much so the show is helping me out a little bit in the background here but what I've been thinking about Matt is that he's potentially going to join up with Logan at some point now obviously the only thing that I have to base this on is the first of nearly 600 pages of this book and the first season of the show which I don't think I think it doesn't go much farther past the plot of this I'm assuming based on what I've read so far this is going to be really funny I don't want to post this vlog because I'm going to come back in 10 books and be like lol you thought but I'm I'm interested to see if Matt is going to go on a little bit of I I don't want him to turn into a full-on bad guy. I feel like there's potential there for that to happen. I, I want some more like anti-hero behavior from him as he's like struggling to be a decent person but is under the influence of this cursed artifact that maybe is gonna lead him down a road that he struggles to get out of. I'm not sure we're gonna get that level of complexity. He may just go straight up bad guy but I do see the potential of him and Logan potentially to team up. It's just a thought I had and that's what this video was for and it's the first kind of theory I feel like I, I've made. Heron I'm also really intrigued about with the wolves but I don't really have any predictions about where that is going to go but I feel like I'm at the point in the book now actually where I can see potential for the future so I was very unassuming and I am very unassuming when I start a fantasy series I kind of just roll with it but now I'm seeing how like Perrin is going to represent um, this older form of magic and Matt is potentially going to end up on the dark side and it's just I'm seeing what I feel are hints of how the characters are going to diverge from this friendship group that started off in the same village and embarked on this adventure together to end up on very different paths in very different places. So I'm excited to see that develop. I only have very vague inklings of like where that's going to go but I, I'm excited because now I do feel like I'm at the point in the book where I'm seeing past what I've read so far and I'm seeing past season one of the TV show and starting to have ideas so that's just generally like an exciting experience. So finally I have made it to the end of the eye of the world i'm really interested in editing this vlog actually because i started this before christmas and it's the last day of january filming this final update so i actually don't have too much to add and i feel like that is the theme of this video i don't have any super reactionary moments and i don't have any wild outlandish theories but also i never really expected to at this point in the series this video was more about potentially hopefully fingers crossed laying the groundwork for further installments of spoiler vlogs on books in the wheel of time series which i mean not to commit to that because that's a lot of books but that is what i currently have planned <laughs> so i have to say my least favorite part of this book was the section in the blight i felt like the pacing at the end of this book didn't match up to the beginning and obviously we had an increase in the pace of the plot because moraine 
was like, guys, we got to hustle to the eye of the world. But I felt like the increase in pace of the storytelling then kind of ruined that for me because I felt like we were galloping through the blight where we'd like pleasantly, quietly strolled through every other area in this world to a point where I could tell you what kind of like tiles they use on the roofs of Whitebridge. And then another reason why I didn't love that end portion as much is that I'm still not really vibing with the action scenes in this series because I do find them to be very jumbled and not very engaging to the point where they're losing my interest which isn't the worst thing in the world because like an action scene is, has never been the most compelling thing for me to read and maybe the ones in this series just aren't for me it's fine I'm assuming they'll play a relatively small part of the series as a whole in comparison to like the amount of walking and <laughs> description and other stuff that we're gonna have going on in here so in terms of where we left Rand in this. I can't say that I'm overly surprised that he has the ability of an Aes Sedai, which I'm, I'm pretty sure is what kind of was going on here. Like he took the power from the eye of the world, right? And now he's found out that he can channel the one power, which is dangerous because that means that he can potentially lose his mind. What I feel like we're doing here is we're setting up for him to be the exception maybe he's gonna struggle through it i imagine he is gonna struggle through it at some point in this series but i feel like what we're returning to is an equilibrium where the is it the sedan sedai sedan that's a car is it in the glossary sedin sedin Saadine? Saadine. Is that how you say that? Saadine? Saadar? Why can't it just be Sai? Saadine. Saadine. That's just difficult to say. But that's the male version, right? So I'm assuming that we're, we're returning to an equilibrium where both men and women can access the true source with Rand being the the person who's going to use it to bring the world back around to was it the age of peace that they're aiming for or is it a return of the age of legends i'm not so sure about matt anymore i do know that his struggle is going to be continuous because they still haven't taken him to tarvalon to remove his connection that he has to this knife i feel like he has the potential to be one of the more interesting characters but because this is my first book from robert jordan i currently don't know whether matt is going to achieve his potential in that way. I do have hope because I know that Brandon Sanderson finishes off this series and not to say that Brandon Sanderson is better than Robert Jordan. It's just I'm familiar with Brandon Sanderson and I feel like Brandon Sanderson being the person who finished this series gives me some sort of level of expectation of what I can expect from this. I can expect this to be a very detailed fantasy series that has um, an intricate plot where the majority of the plot points are going to come into fruition. So there is a possibility that Matt can achieve the like potential of what what has been laid out for him but I feel at this point I'm most interested in Perrin. My favourite characters are definitely Perrin and also Lan. Perrin simply because what lies in store for him feels like it is outside of this plot and this magic system that we've currently established with him going back to the old magics which as something that is currently lost is not something that we've currently learned very much about in this first book. So I'm excited to see more exploration of that. And after meeting the green man, also what else is or has been lost to the old world that is possibly going to return during the course of this series. I also really like Lan and as somebody who does read quite a bit of romance, one of the reasons is because of the Lan Nynaeve plot we have going on. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with that, but what I am speaking of couples, what I am happy about is that Rand and Egwene aren't going to be a thing because that's boring, it's tired, and I don't care. What I do want, if Rand has to be with anybody, I want it to be the Princess of Andor. But anyway, Lan has this complex backstory where he is supposed to be the King of the Seven Towers. He's the last Lord of the Seven Towers, but the Seven Towers don't exist anymore, which gives him even more of this like tortured protector. And then the conversation that he had with Nynaeve, where he's like, I'm happy for the man that you're going to be with, but it's not going to be me because you deserve more. I'm here for that energy. But Nynaeve and Egwene themselves fade into the background a little bit of this book. I feel like they do have their time to shine, but I haven't seen it yet. So at the minute, I don't like, I actually don't like the air of elitism that all of the, is that the right word? Like the, um, the people from Two Rivers, all of them really think 
that they're so good like they have such lofty goals and lofty standards for themselves and each other and it's just given like sheltered by a small town <laughs> so i'm excited hopefully to see those perspectives change throughout the course of this and we i guess we are having some character development so far but at the minute like that's all i'm really seeing from Egwene and Nynaeve i'm excited for the future of their characters and hopefully seeing them come into their own a little bit Maureen is fine when she goes off on her like this is the way the world was and this is why it's going to be this way and like info dumps of history she gets a little bit patronizing and she gets on my nerves a little bit but overall i like her um i guess place in the group to be that character that knows a little bit more and also has a little bit more power so um yeah that's where we stand on eye of the world so far no real predictions right now although obviously the dark one isn't dead because that's the plot right the plot is the dragon versus the dark one we did also pretty much have confirmation in here that rand is the dragon which i mean we all knew anyway so yeah that was that was eye of the world please let me know down in the comments whether you enjoyed this video like i said not expecting it to be the best but hopefully this is the foundation and lays the groundwork of another fucking 14 videos to come so yeah in the in the comments as well be respectful the last thing i need is the fantasy dude bros in my comments telling me how i'm wrong about what happens to matt because in book nine he becomes the fucking emperor of the ailment and i'm so wrong for thinking that based on on, on book one so don't be that guy because nobody likes that guy and don't spoil future books if i'm right don't tell me if i'm wrong don't tell me um because then you're just gonna ruin the whole thing but yeah i do hope you've enjoyed this this deep dive into deep dive did i dive that deep who knows i hope you've enjoyed this video guys i'm signing off if you liked it then like it subscribe if you want to see 14 more of these and i'll see you guys in the next one bye oh you bite your friend like chocolate you say you're a go when nobody knows with guns sitting under our petticoats. We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no.